Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to chapter six. This is our last uh, video about the macronutrients. We've covered carbs and fats and now we're moving on to proteins. So uh, protein, super, super important and I'll, and I'll explain why. But when it comes to the diet, I generally focus on, you know, there are like really good carbohydrates and really bad carbohydrates, right? We have soluble fiber and we've got just added sugar. There are really good fats and really bad fats. You got like your omega-3 fats and monounsaturated fats being really good and things like trans fats being really bad. With protein, it's kind of like <clears throat> there are good and great proteins, right? As long, as long as you're getting what are called complete proteins, where you're getting all the amino acids, all the building blocks you need, the quality of the protein, it matters, but not as much, right? Just, you know, for example, you know, you, you know people think that you need a whole bunch of animal protein if you want to be a bodybuilder or, or a weightlifter and, or, or getting stronger. But, you know, studies show that um, vegan, vegan diets, as long as there's enough protein, and there does have to be slightly more because the quality of the protein isn't as good. Um, it does, you know, eat, eating a plant-based diet doesn't impact these, these gains as much, as much as people think. So it's like there are good proteins and there are great proteins. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. So the icebreaker, most of us recognize meat as a source of protein our bodies use to build cells, including muscle cells and those in our bones, skin, hair, and elsewhere. What is your go-to source of protein? If it were not available, what else could you eat to consume protein? How many alternative sources of protein can you name? So yeah, I think most people, when you ask them what are foods that are high in protein, you would, you would mainly say animal products. You've got your meat and you've got your dairy and you've got your eggs. All great sources of protein, all complete proteins, which are which are really good. And I'll talk about what this term complete means as we move forward. But there are lots of other places that you can get protein, right? I mean, you, you do, you get some protein in, in, in grains and, you know, beans, legumes, nuts, seeds. Those are all uh, great protein sources as well. You've got things like tofu and, and, and that. And then <clears throat> you can get protein from supplements as, as well as on top of food. So there are lots of different places for you to get protein. Uh, another, like, so examples of complete proteins that aren't animal products would be soy protein and quinoa. So Q-U-I-N-O-A. I called it quinoa for a couple years until I was told that it is called quinoa. So, all right. Uh, so those are some examples of alternative proteins. But this goes, you know, think about what we're made of, right? We, as humans, we are bags of 50 to 70% water, <clears throat> And then we're, you know, we, we obviously have water and fat and bone and all these types of things. But, you know, when, once you remove these, our fuel sources like glycogen and fat and you remove water, right? We are, you know, protein is what makes us us and, and protein is what makes us unique, right? Because our genes code for our proteins and that's what makes me, me and you, you, right? We're, we're, we're very, very similar because we're, we're humans, uh, but our variations, what makes us different is that different proteins are being produced, which is why maybe our hair color is different or eye color is different, skin color is different, um, the amount of enzymes we have as far as detoxifying alcohol or digesting sugar, all these things are different because of the proteins that are inside of our body. So yes, we will look at the, the many functions of protein, right? When you think of protein, you probably think of your muscles and there's nothing wrong with that, but but contracting muscles and moving our body through space is only one thing that protein does. Uh, you know, the first thing I think of with proteins in the body is enzymes and enzymes are uh, basically the catalysts that power our metabolism. So, all right, we'll look at all that. Learning objectives. So what should we be able to know at the end of this chapter? Recognize the chemical structures of amino acids and proteins. So amino acids are the individual building blocks that make our proteins. We'll look at those. Summarize protein digestion and absorption. That one's pretty straightforward, especially compared to fat. Describe how the body makes proteins and uses them to perform various roles. We'll cover that list I just started mentioning. Explain the difference between high quality and low quality proteins, including notable food sources of each. That's where we'll talk about complete proteins versus incomplete proteins and, and high and low quality proteins and what that actually means. Identify the health benefits of and recommendations for protein. And, and I will sprinkle in a little bit of extra information here because I'm a, I really, really do think that um, protein is... Is no matter no matter what you think your diet should look like, you know whether you want to be a high carb person, a low carb person, a keto diet, th this that. If I'm helping someone plan their diet, to me it's like let's get let's get your protein taken care of, and let's get your fiber taken care of, and let's make sure you're eating an appropriate number of calories. And after that, you really can just kind of fill in the gaps to make sure you're getting your vitamins and minerals and the fat you need and the, and the carbs and all that kind of stuff. So so proteins are really a big big deal. I also want to talk um, when it's when it's relevant later. 
I want to talk about something that I'm a real firm believer in called the protein leverage hypothesis, which, uh, which, you know, which shows that living you know, animals like us, um, we basically eat until we meet our protein needs. So if you're eating a diet that's too low in protein, your body will send signals that will lead you to overeat to make sure you're meeting, meeting your protein targets. That's one of the reasons that I think that a uh, high protein diet is, is satiating, meaning that it keeps you full longer and you're less likely to overeat on a diet that has some more protein. So generally speaking, um, for most people, I err on the side of putting them on the higher end of protein recommendations instead of lower. But that's, again, not medical advice, just my, my opinion. Okay, <clears throat> the chemist's view of proteins. So proteins, uh, what makes them unique is they have, they have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, same as fat, same as carbohydrates. Remember, remember, fat and carbs are just different arrangements of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's why they're both fuel sources. They're like the hydrocarbons that you put in the fuel tank of your car. But what makes protein unique is the nitrogen. You see there on the amino group, it has nitrogen. So nitrogen is the fourth most common element in the human body, and the only place we get it is from protein. We're exposed to nitrogen all the time, right? Almost 80% of the air you breathe is nitrogen, but it's a, it's a worthless form for us of atmospheric nitrogen. Organisms in the soil that are called nitrogen fixers or fixators they take this atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into the nitrogen that we need to survive. And then we get the nitrogen from eating protein. We get it, get it from eating plants or eating the animals that ate those plants. And that's how, that's how we turn this, or that's how microorganisms help us turn this worthless nitrogen into the fourth most important or fourth most common element in the human body, right? Yeah, so there. Um, so what are amino acids? They all look the same except for that white box there, the side group. They all have a central carbon with the hydrogen off of it. They all have the amino group where the nitrogen is. They all have this acid group, which you see on the green on the right hand side. And then, then each of our 20 amino acids are going to um, have a different side group. So some are going to be hydrophilic, some are going to be hydrophobic. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're going to have different level digestibility, et cetera, et cetera. What makes them different is that side group. All right, so which statement about amino acids is correct? Non-essential amino acids may become essential under certain conditions. So, so non-essential amino acids, so that remember, essential amino acids must be consumed because your, your body can't make them or can't make enough of them. So you have to eat the essential amino acids. Non-essential amino acids can be made in the body, and I'll show you in this, in this lecture, I'll show you how that happens. You can basically turn an... A, uh, you can turn one amino acid into another, and that's how you would build the non-essential amino acids that you need. I think it's best just to make sure you have a constant supply of all of them. But um, but there are but sometimes what's what's normally a non-essential amino acid can become essential, and those are called conditionally essential amino acids. So think about maybe during periods of high stress, maybe you have a certain con genetic condition like phenylketonuria, which maybe you, you've maybe never heard of that, but if you've ever looked at a diet soda, there'll be a warning on there that people that have phenylketonuria should not consume it because it has a lot of phenylalanine in it and, and they can't deal with it. Um, so there, so there, are, there are genetic conditions and there may be periods of high stress or illness or injury where uh, some of the non-essential amino acids become conditionally essential. So let me read what that means. Conditionally essential amino acids are those that are usually non-essential, but under certain conditions must be supplied by the diet. So again, I think just getting a broad spectrum of amino acids in every meal is the smart thing to do. And that's because we don't, we can't store amino acids, right? We, people talk about this amino acid pool, but I've, I've never seen it. I don't know where it is in the human body, right? We just, we constantly have this flux where there are some, there are amino acids available throughout your body, but you don't have an, an area to store it. Um, we, we use proteins and we build muscles and, and the protein portion of bone and all that with muscles or with protein, sorry, but, but we don't have a pool that we can store. Like we can store carbs as glycogen. We can store fat as fat. We don't, we can't store amino acids. <clears throat> Okay, so here you see the amino acids and you have the list of essential and non-essential amino acids. So we need all of them. Notice there are 20. There are other amino acids that are, um, that are in the world, but they're not in the proteins that we consume or that we need, <clears throat> that, we, that we build. So the, these are the only 20 we care about. So you may see different numbers like you see down here at the bottom, things like taurine and ornithine. 
those are not, um, um, they're not any that we care about. So we're just looking at these 20 amino acids. So these are the 20 building blocks that build every protein in your body, right? So your genes code for different combinations of these amino acids, then your body puts them together and that's how it builds proteins. That's how it builds hemoglobin. It's how, how it builds the protein in your muscle, muscle. It's how it builds collagen. All of these come from these amino acids. So the essential amino acids, I'll just say them so you know, you know how to pronounce them. We have histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. And then on the non-essential amino acids, we have alanine, arginine, asparagine, aspartic acid, cysteine, glutamic acid, glutamine, glycine, proline, serine, and tyrosine. So that, you know, obviously they're all important, but the non-essential ones can be, can be created in the body and the essential ones must be consumed. Uh, just looking at a few examples here, let's see valine, leucine, and isoleucine. Those are what are known as your branch chain amino acids. It does, uh, there, they've been used for in, in strength training for years to try to help people recover from exercise and build muscle. If you get if you get enough protein, you don't need to supplement with them. And in some studies, uh, supplementing with them might actually interfere with the absorption of other amino acids that you need. Out of all those, though, leucine appears to be the key. Like if you're trying to synthesize muscle, um, it, it appears that leucine is like the trigger that tells your body there's enough amino acids around to build muscle. So you do want to make sure that there's plenty of leucine in your meals if you, if you are trying to increase muscle protein synthesis. Um, let's see, uh, tryptophan is what we, what your body uses to make melatonin. So that's why people talk about, you know, turkey making you sleepy. Uh, I think it's just the huge meal that we have for Thanksgiving that primarily does that. So yeah, so there's a few in things there. Let's see here. Uh, glutamine seems to be very important for the gut, very, very important amino acid. Glycine. Glycine is one that often our diet is pretty low in because, you know, the average person that eats animal products, they consume a lot of flesh, right? They consume steaks and ground beefs and those kind of things. Those are really high in amino acids like methionine, but um, our ancestors would have ate what's called nose to tail, right? They would have ate the entire animal and they would have, they would have made bone broths and they would have consumed the connective tissue and organs and all that. Those types of foods are much higher in glycine. So the average, the average human today um, does not consume as much glycine as our ancestors would would have, and I think that that, that that occasionally can be a problem. Glycine's been shown to um, enhance sleep. Like I actually supplement personally with three grams of glycine a, a night uh, as a as a sleep aid. So, but again, not uh, not medical advice, but just kind of something interesting there. And let's see, tyrosine there. Uh, your body takes tyrosine and then the mineral iodine, and that's what it, that's what it uses to make thyroid hormones. So, so they all they all they all do very important things. That's just a few examples to highlight there. So, twenty amino acids. 11 are non-essential, not nine are essential, meaning you must consume those. So any complete, this term complete, any complete protein will have all nine essential amino acids in it. An incomplete protein will be missing one or more of them. That's what makes it an incomplete protein. If you're, if you're consuming a complete protein, like the protein from egg whites, for example, um, then you have all, you're meeting all your amino acid needs. If you're completing an, or from quinoa or soy, if you're uh, consuming incomplete proteins like from from grains or legumes, you have to you have to combine foods in a way to make sure you're getting all the amino acids. So here's some examples of just how every amino acid looks exactly the same, except for that side group, and that's where the variation is. So how are proteins built? So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. They're just like the other two macronutrients. They are built using condensation reactions. You remove a water as you put, as you, as you form a peptide bond, this red bond here, the peptide bond that's, that's joining two amino acids together. Then you build a long chain of those, oops, I hit that, sorry. You build a long chain of amino acids and that's gonna be uh, these peptides and then that are polypeptides and then that's gonna form your proteins. So it'd be condensation reactions. And just like the other two macronutrients, hydrolysis reactions, so do this in reverse, is how, is how you split them apart when you digest them. So whenever you're looking at proteins, these are gonna be the four terms you hear as far as their structure. You have primary structure, secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and the quaternary structure. So your primary structure is just the sequence, I think we have better pictures here, yeah. The primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. So which amino acid comes next in the chain? That's called the primary structure. Uh, the secondary structure of a protein would be local changes in shape because you see that these bonds, these, these bonds forming here would cause local um, changes in shape. So that's called the secondary structure of a protein. 
the tertiary structure of a protein is the three-dimensional shape of the entire protein. And the reason that's important is think about proteins kind of like keys. Right? The shape of a key matters because the shape determines its function. So the shape of all the proteins in your body is what determines what they do. If they're not shaped correctly, they won't function correctly and will have problems. So that's called the tertiary structure. Then go back to the list there. The quaternary structure is anytime you take more than one polypeptide chains and fuse them together to form a complete protein. A good example of that would be hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is the, the protein that allows red blood cells to carry oxygen. Well, uh, pro hemoglobin has four subunits that are fused together, and that's what forms the quaternary structure of hemoglobin. All right, so primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. This is an example of insulin. The reason we use this one is it's so short. It's only 51 amino acids. Some of, your, some of the proteins in your body are hundreds of amino acids long, so this is definitely on the shorter end, but this would be our insulin, which we use to help control our blood sugar. And you see that the, 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 the primary structure would just be the sequence of amino acids, and then you see the local changes in shape that are caused by those cross bridges. I think I've said all this. The chain itself would be the primary structure. Di, if you see these terms, dipeptide is two amino acids together, tri is three, and polypeptide would be 10 or more amino acids bonded together. So the primary structure is the amino acid sequence. Secondary structure, local changes in shape. You'll see terms like pleated sheets and alpha helixes, uh, not a huge deal. Uh, tertiary structure, so the three-dimensional uh, shape of that polypeptide chain. And then if you put more than one of them together, then you have a quaternary structure. And that's the hemoglobin example I just shared. So hemoglobin is a protein that's really designed to hold iron, kind of like a wedding ring. A wedding ring would, would hold a diamond. Um, hemoglobin holds iron, and, or, or, and iron is what gives hemoglobin its affinity for oxygen. All right, uh, this, other, this next term, very important. The, so we're talking about building proteins, but denaturing proteins are how they're destroyed. So if the three-dimensional shape of a protein matters so much, if you, if you unravel it and you destroy its three-dimensional shape, you, you change the protein forever. And that's what denaturation is, when you disrupt or destroy the shape of a protein. So the textbook example is always an egg, right? You put an egg on a, on a hot pan or a skillet and it'll be the egg white will be clear. Well, when those proteins are denatured, they become insoluble in water and they become the actual egg white. Um, Digestion would do this. So the reason that we have hydrochloric acid, the reason we have stomach acid, is to one of the reasons is to denature proteins and unravel them so that we can digest them. So the enzymes can actually digest the individual amino acids. Speaking of that, digestion and absorption of proteins. So in the mouth, no chemical digestion occurs, right? Just there's no enzymes that digest protein in the mouth. Just the mechanical breakdown of food occurs there. In the stomach, the stomach is where protein digestion begins. Uh, the, en the enzyme involved in denaturing, or, or the, the stomach acid denatures the proteins. The enzyme involved in actually chemically digesting the protein in your stomach is called pepsin. But notice this term pepsinogen. It's released from the stomach the cells of the stomach as pepsinogen, which is a proenzyme, meaning it's an inactive enzyme that's one step away from being activated. The acid in the stomach actually converts pepsinogen into pepsin, and that's what uh, gives it, turns it on and gives it the power to digest proteins. So protein digestion begins in the stomach, but then we have a lot of other protein digestion enzymes, uh, protein digesting enzymes called the proteases that are going to come from the pancreas and be dumped into the small intestine. So that's where most protein digestion will occur, but some does occur in the stomach. All right, what is the process when a protein uncoils or loses its shape? That would be denaturation. So we talked about that. Denaturation is the change in a protein shape and consequent loss of its function brought about by heat, agitation, acid, bases, alcohol, heavy metals, or other agents. An example of denaturation is cooking an egg, which I gave you, or the curdling of milk. So it's actually, so think about like a baby, like my, my son, we used to call him a feta factory because he was lactose intolerant, we didn't know yet. So he would drink milk, but he would throw up cheese, right? So basically the, the proteins in that milk were being denatured in his stomach, and then he was throwing them back up. Uh, so feta factory was his nickname for quite a while until we realized that he was lactose intolerant and we got that sorted out. All right, so protein digestion, I've already told you in the mouth, nothing chemicals happening, just the mechanical breakdown of food in the, in the stomach. Um, the pepsinogen is being activated and turned into pe pepsin. So pepsin is 
is actually digesting the proteins. Hydrochloric acid is denaturing proteins and helping to break them down. As you can see here, hydrochloric acid denatures the proteins and activates the pepsinogen, turning into pepsin. And pepsin is starting to chop these long chains of amino acids into shorter and shorter chains. Then the food, which is now called chyme, moves into the small intestine, and we have the proteases that come from the pancreas. And then there's also some proteases that are just in the intestinal lining in what's called the brush border. And they're gonna take these the, the remaining polypeptide chains and cleave them and chop them up into tripeptides three, dipeptides two, and individual amino acids. And then the rest of that, the rest of the enzymes are going to finish chopping them up. But the end result is no matter how long of a protein is that you consume, whether it's a 1500 amino acid collagen or a hundred amino acids, doesn't matter. The end result is we will die. We will continue to digest and digest and digest this protein, these polypeptide chains until they are broken down into individual amino acids. And that's, what's going to be absorbed. So you see here, you got a lot of different enzymes involved. I just call them the proteases as a group, but, um, you see that some examples here, you'll notice that trypsin is one of the examples. It breaks peptide bonds, but specifically next to the amino acids, lysine and arginine, whereas chymotrypsin is gonna break bonds next to phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, methionine, asparagine, and histidine. So that doesn't exactly matter, but, but you'll see that these enzymes are looking for, they're just scissors and they're looking for where they can make their cuts. And in the end, all these enzymes work together to turn your proteins into individual amino acids. So you can read the rest of the list there. All right, now let's check number two. Proteins are susceptible to heat and acid. An example of this process in the body is during digestion when proteins are exposed to hydrochloric acid. That's gonna be in your stomach acid. Hydrochloric acid is present in the stomach. Hydrochloric acid uncoils or denatures each protein's tangled strands. Like I showed you that hemoglobin, how coiled up it was. It's gonna unravel that. So your digestive enzymes can actually digest the, the bonds that are holding the individual amino acids together. The hydrochloric acid also converts the inactive form of the enzyme pepsinogen to its active form pepsin. I already mentioned that. All right, now we're so we've digested our proteins down to individual amino acids. Now it's time to absorb them. During absorption, amino acids are transported by specific carriers to intestinal cells. So they're going to be transported to and through the intestinal cells. Those cells are going to take the, the amino acids they need and the ones they don't need, they'll continue on through into the bloodstream and they'll work the way the liver, where the liver will use it to build proteins and, and deaminate amino acids to change them, et cetera, et cetera. All right, why do we need protein? Protein's in the body. So here we see protein synthesis. I won't go into all the great detail here, but this is, uh, this is how our, why we have genes and what they do. You know, we have our, our genetic code is a blueprint. It's basically a, a, a cookbook full of blueprints or something that, um, and each of these genes is going to code for a functional product, which is going to be a, which is going to be a protein. So, so we have DNA, then our body converts DNA into RNA, which is the message that can leave the nucleus and go find a ribosome. Hopefully remember that from anatomy. Ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis where we actually will translate that message into a protein chain. So proteins roll in DNA, uh, the uniqueness of each person. Again, my genes are different than yours, which means that my proteins are different than yours. And that's why I'm different than you. Um, diet. So, you know, making sure we're getting enough protein. Well, you can't do this. And this is um, every protein synthesis has what's called a rate limiting amino acid, right? So in, in any person at any given time, whichever amino acid you have the least of is the rate limiter, right? There are 20 amino acids and you can have 19 of them. Let's say you don't have that leucine we talked about earlier. You have a hundred times more, more of all the other amino acids than you would need, but you don't have any leucine. Well, what would happen? Protein synthesis would halt because anywhere you're building a protein where you would need the, ends, uh, need the amino acid leucine, it would just stop. It couldn't build that protein. So you have to get enough protein to build the proteins in your, human, in your body, but you have to make sure you have all of them or else this whole process would just break down. All right, so let's match these up. Uh, the process of synthesizing messenger RNA. So the process of converting DNA into RNA is called transcription. The protein making factories, so I already mentioned this, the site of translation where proteins are built is called the ribosome. 
um, another type of RNA that carries its amino acids to the messenger RNA. That's the actual translator that reads RNA and brings amino acids with it. That's called tRNA or transfer RNA. And the overall process of making a protein is called gene expression. So your genes are the code. When your genes are expressed, they actually make their functional product. Translation is the process occurring at the ribosome. An error in the amino acid sequence alters the final protein. The amino acid sequence determines the shape or structure, and this shape determines its function. So we've said all that. And you'll see here an example. This is sickle cell anemia. So notice on the right, we have a, a sickled red blood cell. And on the left, we have a normal shaped blood, red blood cell, which is called a biconcave disc. So if someone has this condition, then their genes are coding for a hemoglobin that has, that has the wrong amino acid sequence. So the, 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 the code for hemoglobin is quote unquote wrong, which means the shape of the protein is wrong, which changes the shape of the red blood cell, which changes its ability to carry oxygen. So as the, as the structure changes, so does the function. That's just one example. All right, gene expression and protein synthesis. Uh, all cells, all cells that have DNA can do this, right? We have our red blood cells don't have DNA anymore, but um, that's why they have to be replaced by cells in the bone marrow. But um, each type of cell makes only the protein that it needs, which totally makes sense. And that's why, like, I know we're rushing through this. This isn't the section where I really want to talk about genetics too much. That's covered more in anatomy and other classes. But uh, um, what my skin cells are different than my liver cell because of which genes have been turned off, right? I, all of my DNA is in every one of my cells, but as cells choose the path and decide what they're going to become, they turn off the genes they won't need. So my skin cells are going to make proteins that my liver cells don't, and my liver cells are going to make proteins that my skin cells don't. That's what makes them different. All right, dietary influence on gene expression. Uh, again, this is something we're just beginning to understand. But uh, this idea of like epigenetics, right? We can influence our genes. We can influence how they're expressed. So we can't, we can't change our genes. We can't change our DNA. I don't know if we can, I guess we can by mutating it with radiation and cigarettes and things like that. But um, we can't actually change our genetic code, but we can change how genes are expressed. And this is this whole field of epigenetics, which says that, you know, po so positive diet and lifestyle factors will cause your genes to be expressed in a better way than negative. Um, you know, so if you're, if you're smoking and you don't exercise and you're sleep deprived and you're stressed, your genes are gonna be expressed different than if you are sleeping well and, and happy and, and not malnourished, et cetera. So we, so we can impact our genes. And we've talked about that a little bit in earlier lectures about how like, you know, a high fat diet might, might promote, right, might promote cancer and these types of things. So, yep, a, a healthy per, so this is where you see we all have our genes, right? But there, uh, here's a really a common phrase that says, you know, your genes load the gun, the environment pulls the trigger, right? So you might have genes, you might have a higher risk of heart disease than someone else because of your genes, but it's not a guarantee you're gonna get heart disease. If you do the right things, that trigger may never get pulled. And so, you, so that means you have to be more diligent and more careful about your diet and your lifestyle factors than a typical person. And just on the flip side, so I mentioned in the last video, uh, the last lecture about um, how some people have familial hypercholesterolemia. Well, their genes, their genes mean that they're going to have high cholesterol, and they're going to have to do things that, that you and I don't have to do to, to have the same risk of dying of heart of a heart attack than you and I do. But on the flip side, there are people that have genes that that make their cholesterol really low, right? and their lifetime risk of heart disease is, is greatly diminished. Right? They they um, the, the, their chances of getting heart disease, even if they make a bunch of mistakes is still almost zero. So your gene, so genes do influence things, but they, they predispose us to certain diseases maybe. So maybe cancer runs in your family or heart disease runs in your family or diabetes runs in your family, but none of those things have to, are guaranteed. You just have to work harder to protect yourself from those things in, with the lifestyle stuff, with the environmental stuff. All right, so what do we use proteins for? So I think most people think of proteins as structural materials. We have you know, your, your, your muscles, uh, your tendons, your ligaments, uh, the, the connective tissue that holds your body together, uh, the protein portion of your bones, right? About 30% about of your bones is protein. So you see there that this collagen matrix, it, once it's filled with minerals, becomes bones or teeth. If you ever wanna see a really cool example of that, take a, 
uh, a cleaned chicken bone or something and put it in vinegar that for a week, let's say. The vinegar will um, remove the minerals, but the, the bone will still look the same. But when you take it out of the vinegar, it'll be flexible. And that's because the, the collagen is still there. The protein is still there, but you've removed a bunch of the minerals. So there is a protein component to things like bones. Um, proteins are needed to replace dead or damaged cells. So, I mean, every day, you know, countless cells have to be re repaired or replaced in the human body. Uh, and, and we can break down old proteins and reuse them. So it's pretty cool. We need a lot more protein in a day than we eat. And how we get away with that is whenever you're building a new protein in your body, let's say seven of, the, of every eight amino acids that you're using to build a new protein were old recycled ones. And that one out of every eight has to be a new one that came from your diet. So we are, we're constantly breaking ourselves down and building ourselves back up. And yes, we do lose, we do lose protein. Some things get broken beyond repair. Some things are just lost. So um, when that happens, that's why we have to eat protein, right? You can't just not eat protein and let your body just continue to recycle and repair itself. You'll be in trouble there. So we can, we can reuse a lot of the amino acids in the human body, but we do need a constant supply of new ones as well. All right, so those are kind of structural things. Then enzymes, I've already mentioned, these are catalysts that speed up the chemical reactions in our body. So almost every reaction in your body is, is sped up or powered by an enzyme and the enzymes are made of proteins. This is just showing how enzymes work. Hopefully you understand that. They, the textbook definition would say that they lower the activation energy, which, which basically means that enzymes make each metabolic reaction in our body occur with less energy and it's going to occur much faster and much easier as well. So enzymes are critically important. Like you couldn't build, you couldn't even build a, a theoretical living organism without at least hundreds of enzymes. So they, they're, they are the reason we are alive. Um, what else? Proteins. So you see that some of our, a lot, a lot of our proteins are, are, are hormones, are protein hormones. Uh, you know, in anatomy, we talk about the, the peptide hormones, which you see a bunch of them here. And then we do have some um, hormones that are made of individual amino acids. So I won't go through the whole list, but, but the huge majority of your proteins are made of our, our peptides, our amino acids, our huge majority of your hormones, sorry. Um, the steroid hormones are made of fat or, and cholesterol, but are made of cholesterol, but uh, most of your hormones are made of proteins. So hormones are your endocrine system. And you can see some examples there and read those. Um, proteins as regulators of fluid balance. So you see here if someone has an imbalance, if they don't have enough protein in their blood, then their flu basically fluid is constantly pumped out of your blood vessels and then sucked back in. It's pumped out by hydrostatic pressure, fluid pressure, and sucked back in by osmosis. But you need proteins to do that. So if you don't have enough proteins in your blood because uh, you're really malnourished or you have liver failure, then the, the fluid will be pumped out of your blood, but it won't be sucked back in and you'll develop edema, which you can see in this picture here. So uh, I always you know, talk about like, um, basically there's two types of malnourished children. You see really skinny children and then you see really skinny children that have a pot belly, right? But the belly is fluid, it's not fat. That kid is way worse off. That means they have so little protein that their liver can't even generate the proteins like albumin that you need to regulate fluid balance. So that's, that's a serious problem. Um, acid base, so, so proteins play a big role, uh, functioning primarily as buffers. So they help, to, they help pH, uh, keep pH changes from occurring in the body. So proteins are, are part of maintaining your acid base or pH balance. Uh, proteins are transporters on your cells and they're also transporters through the blood. And so here you see an example of a protein transporter in a cell membrane, but there also are proteins that carry uh, lipid soluble hormones and things like that through our bloodstream. Uh, sex hormone binding globulin would be one example. Speaking of the globulins, right, you have the immunoglobulins. Those are your antibodies, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, and IgD. So proteins are a huge part of your immune system as well. Just giving you lots of examples. Well, that's the next one here. So antibodies are made of proteins. Um, they can be used for fuel. Remember, we've said on several of the lectures so far, uh, gluconeogenesis, your body can turn non-carbohydrates into glucose, and that's in it, and primarily uses proteins. So proteins can be turned into fuel. Um, the downside of that is, remember, protein has nitrogen on it. So if you're going to use protein as a fuel source, you've got to deal with this excess nitrogen, which we'll cover in just a moment. Um, what else? We talked about antibodies, energy, blood clotting. So uh, blood, blood, the fibrinogen is, is, a, is the uh, protein that's turned into fibrin, and that's how blood clots. So that would be, that'd be an example of proteins needed for blood clotting. Uh, vision, you, you, need, you need protein for everything, really. All right. Um, 
Okay, a preview of protein metabolism. So we're gonna we're gonna cover metabolism in a whole separate chapter. But I mentioned the protein turnover, right? Your body is constantly being broken down and repaired and renewed, and that protein turnover. So the huge majority of the amino acids you're gonna use today, or seven eighths of them, anyways, are gonna come from recycled proteins. And then you need to you need to constantly be topping off the tank, so to speak. This amino acid pool, as I mentioned earlier, like I don't know where this pool is in your body. I know we have this constant influx and efflux of proteins, but we really, we don't store them. So we do, that's why you just need this supply, whether it's coming from your diet or coming from the breakdown of old proteins, doesn't really matter, but you do need a constant supply of them because they're not stored. Protein breakdown. So just that's the, you know, when you're repairing proteins and you're breaking down organelles, you're just going to reuse the amino acids and then you top off the tank with dietary proteins. All right, so fill in the blank. When nitrogen intake and output are equal, a person is in what's called nitrogen balance or nitrogen equilibrium. Infants, children, and pregnant women are in a state of positive nitrogen balance. And if protein is being lost and nitrogen excretion is greater than intake, a person is in a state of negative nitrogen balance. So if you're not growing or shrinking, you should be in a state of nitrogen balance, which means like you're consuming enough protein to maintain your body. If you're growing, so you see infants, children, pregnant women, or if you're you know, trying to add 10 or 20 pounds of muscle, let's say you're an athlete or whatever, you need to be in a state of positive nitrogen balance. So there's, um, you, have, you have more than enough proteins to build on the body you already have or build another body inside of you if you're pregnant. On the flip side, if you're if you're dieting or you're starving or you're, you're protein malnourished, you're going to be losing nitrogen every day. So you're going to be breaking down more tissue than you can then you can maintain and rebuild. This is why, you know, if someone loses 50 pounds really rapidly, you you'd have to assume that depending on how it's done, uh, 15, 20, 25 or even slightly more than 25 of those pounds could be lean tissue because of this negative nitrogen balance situation. All right, um, other, other ways we use amino acids. So I, I mentioned this first one already, but we, you make things with it. So I, yes, we have a bunch of hormones that are peptides, but we also have hormones that are made of individual amino acids. So you see here, tyrosine is used to make epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is adrenaline and noradrenaline. Tyrosine is also used to make thyroid hormone. And then tryptophan, uh, can be used to make niacin and, and the uh, brain chemical or the body chemical, I guess, the neurotransmitter, serotonin. And tryptophan can also be used to make melatonin. So those would be some examples. Um, we've talked about energy. If you're, if you're out of carbs and fat as a fuel source, your body can turn lean tissue into glucose. Similar to fat and carbohydrates, protein is also easily stored in the body. The answer is false. So I guess we have this little puddle, this amino acid puddle or pool, uh, but we, there is no way to store amino acids. You, you, you use them uh, or, or you don't, and that's why you need a constant supply of them. Next, using amino acids to make proteins and non-essential amino acids. So you see here that, uh, again, you can swap some of these parts around to make new amino acids. It's, I mean, to me, it's easier just to make sure you're getting all of them, but your body can take, um, your body can build can basically turn one non-essential amino acid into another. So if you need a whole bunch of, of an individual amino acid, your body just kind of makes it as it needs it. Not a big deal, but you see there, this is called transamination. So you're moving the amino group from one amino acid to another. And that requires the vitamin B6 is the coenzyme that's needed to power this process. Deamination is different. So if you're going to, if you're going to remove the nitrogen group from an amino acid, mainly to turn it into a fuel source, then you've got a deal, you, get, you take off the amino group and now we have to deal with this nitrogen. And that's, that's gonna be what we, do, what we do with it here because we can't have all this ammonia floating around in us, which is NH3. So you take two ammonias and mix it with the carbon dioxide and you make urea. And that's how we would get rid of the excess nitrogen that we don't need as, we, because we used protein for uh, something that didn't require the nitrogen. So then we excrete it. So you see here that the ammonia becomes urea and then our liver gets rid of the urea into the bloodstream and it goes to the kidneys and we get rid of it as one of our primary waste products in urine. So you see here that urea, the principal vehicle for excreting unused nitrogen is the urea that you'd find in your urine, increases with protein intake, which makes sense because if you're, if, you're, if you're eating more protein than you need as a, at a base minimum, then your body will have to do something with that protein, turn it into glucose, turn it into fat. And if it's doing that, it has to remove the nitrogen group. 
And it does require, right? Anytime you got to get rid of something in your urine, there is what's called obligatory water loss. So if, you if you're making more urea, then you're going to make more urine and you're going to need more water. So that's why if you go on a higher protein diet, I do recommend you consume more water for, for that reason. And that's why you see, you know, like your bodybuilders and athletes that are famous for eating a whole lot of protein, they're also famous for drinking a gallon of water a day, which is probably not a bad idea. So discussion question. Why would a person on a high protein diet be at risk of dehydration? Well, we just said it. If they're, um, well, uh, let's just look at the answer. But because if you've got to get rid of urea, then you have to use water to, to make the urine to get rid of urea. So urea is the body's principal vehicle for excreting unused nitrogen. And the amount of urea produced increases with protein intake. To keep urea in solution, the body needs water. For this reason, a person who regularly consumes a high protein diet must drink plenty of water to dilute and excrete urea from the body. Without extra water, a person on a high protein diet risks dehydration because the body uses its water to rid itself of urea. This explains some of the water loss that accompanies high protein diets. So again, um, yeah, if, you're, if, you're, if your water intake stays the same, but your protein intake goes up, you will be more dehydrated because you're going to lose more water as urine, but you didn't make up for it by increasing your uh, fluid gains. Proteins in food. So where do we find it? So when you're looking at protein quality, so if you call, if you call a protein a high quality or low quality protein, what does that mean? So the first thing is digestibility, which depends on factors such as the source and the food eaten with it. So... Um, so what proteins are digested the best? A whey protein is a famous example of, of being the, a really quickly digested protein. Whey protein, egg white protein, these kind of proteins, um, they're generally, you know, they're, they're digested really well. Uh, then the, other th the next thing that determines protein quality is the amino acid composition. You have to have all of the essential amino acids to be considered a complete protein. So if you have, um, like, I'm trying to think, uh, let's see, I actually have a bottle here. So my, so my collagen protein, it's got... It's got a lot of um, it's got a lot of protein in it, right? A serving of this collagen protein would be 18 grams of protein. But if you look at the you can't see it doesn't matter. But if you look at the typical amino acid profile, you will see there's zero milligrams of tryptophan. So this is not a high quality protein because if I tried to live on that, I wouldn't have any tryptophan in my diet. So you have to have all of the key essential amino acids for a protein to be considered a high quality protein. Okay, a reference protein, the quality of protein determined by comparing amino acid composition with essential amino acid requirements. So again, it's just does it, does it meet, does it meet this basic standard of having all the essential amino acids you need? And then a high quality protein has all the essential amino acids in large enough amounts, not just some, but enough that, that's that's required by humans. Like I mentioned earlier, having some, like um, let me see here. Um, this, this has 524 milligrams of leucine. That's, that's not enough. If you're trying to build muscle, collagen's not the way to do it. Like I use collagen protein occasionally for some different reasons, like joint health and stuff, but um, there's no tryptophan and there's not very much leucine. This is not a high quality protein. It is not one that a human would want to build muscle out of basically. All right. Um, so what, high quality protein, I use that term complete protein there. And then an incomplete protein would be missing something like that. All right, so here this is why these terms matter because if you are if you're going if your diet is based around incomplete proteins, then you need what are called complementary food combinations. So if you if you eat any animal product, so meat, dairy, eggs, they're all complete protein sources. If you don't eat animal products because you're a vegan, then um, you can eat soy and quinoa because those are complete proteins as well. But if you don't, if, if you're, so here's some example. If you're, if you're a vegan and your diet is based around legumes or beans and grains, that's perfectly fine as long as you eat them together because legumes are going to be incomplete proteins. Grains are going to be incomplete proteins, but they, but when you take them together, they cover the deficiencies of the other ones. Let me read this point. In general, legumes provide plenty of isoleucine and lysine, but don't provide enough methionine and tryptophan. So that's legumes, beans. But grains have the opposite strengths and weaknesses. So grains have enough methionine and tryptophan, but don't have enough isoleucine and lysine. So if you eat only beans, 
let's say red beans. You eat only red beans, you're in trouble. You eat only rice, you're in trouble. You eat red beans and rice, you're no longer in trouble. So that's a complementary food combination. A well thought out, well planned vegan diet can absolutely be, be healthy and can absolutely give you the proteins that you need. Um, so like a peanut butter sandwich on whole grain bread, red beans and rice, right? These, these uh, a salad with pine nuts or seeds added to it. Those are gonna be examples of what are called complementary food combinations. And so you get your complementary proteins. Neither of these would be good enough on their own. They'd both be incomplete. Combine them and they now form a complete protein or a complete protein matrix, whatever term you wanna use. Okay, protein quality is influenced by which two factors? What is the difference between animal and plant protein quality? Why are some proteins considered to be high quality or complete? All right, protein quality is influenced by the protein's digestibility and its amino acid composition. So animal proteins are, are the gold standard, like uh, whey protein and egg white protein it would, be, it would be like gold standard examples because they're more digestible. You see here 90 to 90% digestible compared to plant proteins being 70 to 90% digestible. And then animal proteins all have all the amino acids. So that's why they would be considered the highest quality protein. But I just showed you collagen proteins from animal products are not high quality because they don't have the, all the essential amino acids you would need and they don't have the, the right amounts. So can you build a healthy diet around plant proteins? Of course you can, but since they're not digested as well, uh, like if you want to build, you know, if you want to use pea protein, soy protein, those kind of things, since they're not digested as well, you should consume more protein to make up for the fact that they're not digested as well. And then if you're consuming a bunch of incomplete proteins, you have to make sure that you put them together in those complementary food combinations. Health effects and recommended intakes of protein. So, um, just in the basics, uh, a sedentary, so your, your protein intake is, is really determined by your activity level. So how many proteins are going to be broken down and need to be repaired? So uh, the, a nice safe, like the RDA for protein for a sedentary adult is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So your kilograms, you take your, your weight in pounds and divide it by 2.2. That's how many kilograms you weigh. Take that times 0.8. That's the RDA of protein if you're sedentary. Remember, the RDA is the floor. That is the minimum you're supposed to consume, not the maximum. So the RDA is the floor. You're supposed to consume at least that much if you're a sedentary adult. So let's make it an easy example. If, you're, if you weigh 220 pounds, then you'd be 100 kilograms. And if you're a sedentary adult, then you would take that 100 times 0.8 and you should be consuming 0.8 or you should be consuming 80 grams of protein a day. That's the RDA. That's the floor. So you, you're, you'll probably want more than that. But then if you're, um, if you're an athlete, that number climbs, right? If you're, if you're a strength athlete, you probably want to get closer to um, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram, which really boils down to right in the ballpark of one gram per pound of body weight. So if you're a 220 pound power lifter, then you'd want to eat 220 grams of protein. But again, these are, these are just kind of the basic guidelines. So the, t and, and if you're, if you're a vegan, then you're going to want to eat more protein too, because of the digestibility issues. So let's say if you're a, a vegan or a, a meat eating strength athlete, you, you shoot for like 1.6 grams per kilogram. If you're a vegan strength athlete, maybe you'd shoot for 1.7 or 1.8, but, but it is size dependent, right? The, 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 the bigger you are, uh, the more protein you need. But again, if you're, let's say you need to lose hundred pounds, right? Maybe you should go, maybe you should do your, your goal weight might be, might be a better idea. If you weigh 300 pounds and you want to weigh 200 pounds, 220 pounds, let's say you don't, you don't need 300 grams of protein. Um, maybe you'd use your goal weight, that 220 would be how you determine your protein intake, but you just, you gotta play with these things. All right, so what happens if you don't get enough? Protein deficiency. Um, I mean, we've already talked about it. It halts protein synthesis and you'd have a really hard time. Uh, protein er energy malnutrition, we talked about the examples where um, you'd have so little protein in your body that you're, you, you're developing edema and, and things like that. Um, all right, so heart disease, so animal protein intake has been linked to heart disease once you're saturated, not all saturated fat is bad, but once your saturated fat intake reaches, you know, above 10%, especially above 18%, that's where you start to see problems. So animal protein comes with saturated fat. It's nothing, the protein is great. So if you, if you don't want heart disease, then eat leaner animal protein sources. So less saturated fat, more of the high quality protein. 
Um, let's see. I mean, arginine is a, is a vasodilator. Nothing super interesting there. Uh, so cancer, notice it says protein-rich foods, not the protein content of food. So this is, this means that, you know, a lot, of, think about some of our foods that have a lot of protein are going to have a, a lot of sugar, salt, fat, you know, these kind of things. It's not the protein in your food that, that does anything when it comes to cancer. It's just that the, the foods that have a lot of protein also have things that might increase your risk of cancer. Um, so maybe there is some there is some link between uh, protein intake and l calcium losses. So if you're eating a higher protein diet, you may want to make sure you're getting plenty of calcium. If you're getting a lot of your protein from dairy products, that's probably being taken care of. Uh, weight control. So let's talk about, this is where I wanted to talk about that protein leverage hypothesis a little bit more. So studies have shown that people will eat subconsciously until their protein needs are met. So they did these really cool feeding studies where they put people at buffets and let them eat until they were full. full. And the foods all looked really similar, but the difference was with the, with different or the same groups and different groups and different studies. But the percent of of calories that were on the tables that came from protein would change. But people, everyone in the groups or the typical person in each group ate until their protein needs were met. Were met, which meant that if the percent of the calories in a meal from protein were lower, they would eat more to reach that protein target. So this, and this could actually, you can look into this, but the protein leverage hypothesis, I think it does a really good job of explaining the obesity epidemic, right? That um, one of the things that happened is people like to demonize carbs and demonize fat, but the real issue is as we started to eat more carbs and more fat, the percent of our calories from protein went down. So we started to overconsume food to make up the difference. And, and I, so I do believe if you're trying to lose weight that you've got to get your protein first. Protein and fiber because they're satiating. They'll keep you feeling full, and then you then you kind of let the let the chips fall where they may, so to speak, as far as the rest of your diet. But if you're trying to lose weight, you should you should. And this is not medical advice, but I'd recommend um, making sure you're getting plenty of protein because of its its satiating effects and the fact that you eat less calories when you consume a higher protein diet. Uh, kidney disease very important to note here. It is possible that if you already have kidney disease, that a high protein diet can cause problems. Not all studies show that, but high protein diets do not cause kidney problems. Uh, that's, that's been a, a myth about protein consumption for forever. Uh, that is just not the case. All right, so the guidelines, what we, I, I gave you some of those recommended you know, guidelines like the 0.8 grams and things like that. So um, where should we, where do we get our Protein. I mean, if you if you eat animal products, then lean animal products and maybe low fat dairy products. These these kind of things would be a good place to go. Um, you can get protein from fruits, vegetables, and grains, but they're you're not going to get a lot of them, and you got to make sure you get um, right combinations. So, um, yeah. So that's so that's kind of where we're at with protein. Protein and amino acid supplementation. So this. Um, so if you're building muscle, right, obviously you, you need more protein. So some people use protein powders and they have been shown to be helpful. You don't need them. If you can reach your protein targets without without protein shakes, then then absolutely. Protein shakes are great. Whey protein is a great way to get, let's say you've reached the end of the day and you're like, uh-oh, I'm 30 grams away from my protein target for the day and I'm trying to build muscle, then have a protein shake. But they're but they're not needed. Uh, as far as like this, this idea of the anabolic window, like you've got plenty of time to get protein. If you're getting your protein over three or four or five, Five different feedings in a day, and you're you're good. It doesn't, you know, there is no magical window after you work out. Um, you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and drink protein. Th these these kind of things, it just doesn't seem to make a big difference. Uh, whether someone consumes consumes protein three times a day or eight times a day doesn't really seem to impact um, uh, muscle gain at all. So get your calories, get your protein, uh, spread it out over at least three servings. I recommend four or five, but um, uh, that will work. So if you're getting enough protein, then supplementing with them individual amino acids doesn't appear to do much good. I've already mentioned earlier that branch chain amino acids have kind of been debunked as a, as a protein. If you're going to supplement with something that isn't just a whey protein or a protein that has all the amino acids, then maybe an essential amino acid supplement that has all of the essential amino acids would make more sense than just the branch chain amino acids. But uh, I just don't think it's needed. Just um, you know, get 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 protein from good healthy sources. Try to get as much as you can from whole food. Use protein shakes to fill in the gaps, and you should be good. Okay, uh, what have we learned? Recognize the chemical structure of amino acids and proteins. Check. Summarize protein digestion and absorption. Check. 
Describe how the body makes proteins and uses them to perform various roles. Check. Explain the differences between high quality and low quality proteins or complete and incomplete proteins, including notable food sources of each. And identify the health benefits of and recommendations for protein. All right, I think we did it. All right, I hope this helps. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed.